Welcome to the show. It's nice thank to you. meet you and thank you for coming. Um, let's just start off. Could you introduce yourself for my listeners, please? Uh, my name is Igor Galenkar, and uh, I'm a professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai and a director of the uh, Suicide Research Prevention Lab and also of the Family Center for Bipolar Disorder. I just always ask anyone who comes on the show, mm -hmm. who especially who works in this specific field, what piqued your interest about it? You know, was there something in the family unit or growing up that led you towards psychiatry? My initial uh, interest actually was intellectual curiosity. Okay. I was reading a lot and uh, Freud seemed interesting. And uh, uh, I'm a scientist and uh, uh, by training and by nature, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the puzzle of human mind and what make us move and uh, do what we do has always been uh, uh, like seemed unsolvable to me. And so that's why I Can wanted to solve the puzzle. Uh, my postdoc was in... Um, uh, uh, in uh, biology, in human genome, and then I realized, well, there's a whole new field, and what's the most interesting there? Human mind. I actually started, uh, 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 I was a resident at Mount Sinai, and my f first uh, uh, job, clinical job, was an inpatient attending, so I'm actually, uh, uh, was uh, working with, vi from the outset, with very acute people, uh, people who are very sick, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, suicidal. That mm -hmm. was from the very beginning because that's uh, uh, those who get hospitalized on inpatient unit. Uh, they in the United States get hospitalized for dangerousness, not for mental illness. You can be very ill but not be in the hospital. So I've been dealing with dangerous people uh, for uh, from the very beginning. That's why I'm comfortable uh, working with suicidal patients um, because uh, you know uh, just. I know, I know what's going on and they don't scare me. When I was preparing for our interview, I read that suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 24. Right. And there's nearly one death every 11 minutes right. in the United States. For my listeners, why do people commit suicide? That, that is the most uh, difficult question, really, mm -hmm. that you may want to ask. Uh, why? And um, we've been working for 15 years trying to figure out uh, why and came up with the whole theory, which is uh, now in the second edition of my book. Uh, it's called Narrative Crisis Model of Suicide. It's very scientific. Uh, and I can go over it later on if you're, if you're interested. Um, the, uh, from my end, mm -hmm. okay, as a doctor preventing suicide, um, why uh, is actually not the most important question. Uh, uh, what most important question is how acute the suicidal state is, how close they are, or maybe uh, to attempting suicide, even dying, and what can I do to prevent it at the time. And why, which is a stressful life event in our lingo, the stress that brought in, is actually about five steps back. Oh, wow. I didn't mm. realize. Yes. Um, are there any biological components to suicidality? Like, can you talk a little bit about nature versus nurture? Yes, of course. Um, so uh, the, uh, the way they might, might as well talk about our theory because mm -hmm. it's also a framework for suicide prevention. So there's some people uh, who are, have what we call long-term risk factors for suicide, of which there are many. And they're so shown uh, to be associated with uh, people dying by suicide lifetime, not tomorrow, lifetime. And some of them are you know, known, for instance, you would think that impulsivity is one of them, but that's not the main one. Uh, the main one is perfectionism. Uh, and uh, that is to some degree inherited. The second one is fearlessness, which is also inherited. Uh, the third one is pessimism that is also to some degree genetic. So that's nature. Mm. Um, then um, there are certain things which are uh, nurture. Okay. And uh, this is some of them are history, upbringing, environment, stress. So for instance, a particular uh, childhood abuse is associated with increased risk. Um, the um, trauma is associated with increased risk. Certain a parenting style 
okay, is associated with increased risk, for instance. Um, and the past suicidal behavior is associated with increased risk. So this is the nurture. And then what about if suicide, like if, if someone is suicidal in the family unit, does that increase risk yes. for the child? Yes, yes, history of suicide in the family, uh, which is partially genetic and uh, partially uh, uh, history, just history. Is it always preventable? Uh, well, nothing is a hundred percent, but uh, the uh, uh, yes, I would say most of the time, yes. Yes, it just it just comes down to when you step in. Uh, well, and it's also um, what uh, what you do and what you treat. The next step, uh, let's say, coming back to the uh, theory. So, if you, you have a person that I described to you with long term risk factors and certain history. Are they at risk lifetime. Okay. If something happens in their life that doesn't go right, which we, let's call it stress, stressful life event, their risk goes up dramatically. They get fired from their job. Got fired they, from their they job. They lose a loved one. Some yes. kind of traumatic. They get in a car accident. Yes. Okay. There's not too many of these, by the way, stressful life events. Too many categories. Maybe like seven. Okay. That's all it is. There's only seven of them. Well, generally speaking, yeah. about seven. I can name them for you. Yeah. Could you name them? Sure. Um, the two most important ones is final romantic rejection. Final, okay, is the is the is the term, and that is associated with an increased risk for suicide within twenty four hours. Um, I relate to that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if somebody made it through two weeks, three weeks, okay, the danger uh, danger goes down. Then catastrophic financial failure of some sort, eviction. For somebody who is responsible for family, uh, chronic, uh, relentless mental illness, okay, which is uh, hard to treat, and people are in constant pain because of that, nothing works. Um, new uh, onset of serious medical illness, okay, for uh, cancer for, diagnosis, right, right. bullying, okay, okay, and some kind of threat to identity. Uh, uh, a core identity, like for instance, somebody who is a, a researcher and uh, you know worked on their life uh, on pr proving something. Turn, uh, it turns out that everything they've done was falsified by their research assistant. It's a threat to, to identity. It's not financial failure. Something, something like that. So these are primarily all the categories. If one of this happens, something like this happens to people who are at long-term risk, uh, then. Uh, they uh, enter a particular frame of mind, okay, that we call suicidal narrative, and it's a thought pattern, and it's a life story that they they see, they see that in themselves, life narrative, and that li life narrative is uh, the following picture, following story. I strived for something that was incredibly important uh, to me, and if I only achieved that goal, I would be happy, and only that goal would make me happy. And I failed. Mm -hmm. And that goal could be uh, a family, perfect family. It's a goal to be a stable career, a goal to be being in medical school for a recent immigrant. Uh, a goal could be being popular. A okay. goal to marry someone to specific. To marry someone specific, absolutely. And only that, uh, 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 and I failed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot change that goal. I cannot find somebody else. I cannot choose a different career. I cannot disengage and re-engage. The rabbit hole of hopelessness. Yeah, right. And that uh, makes me feel defeated, humiliated, and I cannot tell anybody about this because I'm a burden to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any future without it that's acceptable to me. And all this is thinking. Okay, it's, uh, people can't keep thinking that. And that can go on for days or weeks, I mean, typically. Okay, not always, but typical. And uh, um, that alone uh, uh, is not quite there. Mm -hmm. But then when something else happens, uh, that a person can develop a fairly short-lived state of mind. That's what we call suicide crisis syndrome. Uh, and that lasts, comes in waves. And it's actually very short-lived. And it lasts hours to, to days, maximum days, but usually hours. Uh, but it lasts much longer, typically, than the conscious 
impulse or desire uh, to kill yourself. To actually do to the actually act. do it. Much longer. Okay. Critical difference. And some people, by the way, uh, go on to kill themselves without ever being suicidal. Mm -hmm. And I can give, uh, tell you uh, a couple of examples of that. So if you intercept, recognize and intercept that state, suicide crisis syndrome, and treat it, suicide is preventable. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, uh, our estimate in our lab, if people would use our approach uh, to suicide prevention, which we'll talk about in the United States alone, conservatively, we'll probably save 10,000 lives a year. Wow. And so that's what you're working on in the that's research. Way. And so that is what you call the suicide trigger state, or is that something else? Suicide trigger state was the early name okay. for it. Uh, we started that, uh, and then we changed it to suicide crisis syndrome for better or for worse. Okay. So that's what it's <laughs> called right now. And so what does immediate risk for suicide kind of look like? Can you give me some examples? Uh, meaning what the state looks like? Yeah. Uh, what is that mental state? Yeah, like someone who's in that state where they may act on it. Are they, you know, in their bed? Are they having panic attack? Oh. Or it differs per person. It's, I would think, uh, I would uh, kind of try to maybe not talk about risk as much. Okay. Okay, because um, it is the mental state that needs to be treated. When, when people are in that mental state, life becomes unbearable and they could do whatever is next to them. I guess, how do you recognize that okay, state? Okay, that's really, really important. So uh, the most important thing about that state, and now I'm going to sound a little bit like a, 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 a broken record because I talk about it a lot. Um, so um, our the way we now assess suicide risk, we ask a person if they're suicidal, mm -hmm. and we've been doing it forever. And uh, one of the reasons... Um, in this is that uh, in my very first or second year of my uh, psychiatric career, I had a patient uh, who died by suicide, one of my first patients actually, when I knew very little. Uh, and um, he, I treated him for a year. Uh, and um, uh, we were talking about this all the time, and he was telling me that absolutely he's not going to do it and uh, because he wants to reconstruct his life the way it was. Um, something terrible happened to him. I mean, he was in a relationship and uh, for 20 years, and then after his uh, uh, partner die, died, he was gay. Um, the, uh, the, his part, partner's wife and three children showed up to the funeral. At the funeral, they were all younger, young, so it, the person led a double life, and that was basically catastrophic. That was a blow to core identity that I just described to you. Uh, that couldn't, he couldn't survive. And we worked with this on, uh, uh, on it for a year. Uh, and then one day he um, said, well, uh, I think I'm going to go to uh, Asia. And then he left. And then 24 hours later, I got um, uh, uh, a call uh, from uh, the local precinct that he killed himself. And then a year, a, a week later, I got a letter from him with a gift. And uh, uh, the letter was, Sorry, Doc, you, I don't blame yourself. I was really lying to you at the end. I planned it all along, not for long, but for, for, for several days. And, uh, uh, you know, you're good. Okay, don't blame yourself. I just couldn't take it anymore. And so why that is important uh, is that you cannot trust somebody who is suicidal to tell you that they're suicidal. Yeah. I mean, you really can't. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that I, we know that uh, there are about at least two reasons for that, different reasons. One reason is that out of fear of being confined in a hospital, out of fear of being stopped, uh, people who are really suicidal are not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the state is so short-lived and conscious suicidal wish could be so short-lived that they wouldn't know. And for that reason, when we started working on this state, which is called suicidal state of mind, called suicide crisis syndrome, suicidal ideation is not part of it. When you tell the story mm -hmm. to me about this first patient, <coughs> mm -hmm. does it make you emotional? Yeah, still. Um, still? Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of stigma just in the, me in the community, the medical community, if for therapists, psychologists, mm -hmm. if you have a patient that follows through with suicide, there's a lot of shame. Did you ever feel that shame? Um, yes. It's not something that's easy um, to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I, now in my life, I treated 35,000 people. Yeah. <clears throat> of those 35,000 people, 10,000 were suicidal. Of those 10,000, uh, three people died by suicide under my care. I told you about the first one. And nine people died by suicide within a month after they left my care. So, um, as you know, people who work with cancer patients, um, you kind of develop a way of coping with this. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still shameful and still difficult uh, to talk about. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it's not uh, people die from cancer and their oncologists who work with it. And uh, the fact that people die by suicide and it's shameful should not prevent us from working with them and saving lives. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing. A hundred percent. And I think you're doing important work. I just think there's so much stigma and shame just around this topic mm. that needs to be combated. I don't know if you are familiar with um, how much your assistant told you about the show. And I spent time at McLean, but there was a patient who, after leaving and being mm. there six months, committed suicide. And I remember when my therapist did, uh, just to see her even talk about that mm-hmm. is is difficult. I think even for some of the residents, counselors, and you know the younger people who are just starting their career, it was kind of a moment that's, as a human, how do you yes. deal with that? You're a doctor, but at the same time, you're still a person and you have feelings and you had a relationship with this person for a year. Of course. Um, of course. And to get a letter or a gift and to be told it's not your fault. Um, oh, he was a really thoughtful person. Yeah. Okay. If he didn't send me this letter, I don't think I would start working on suicide prevention. Oh, really? So this kind of, this jump started it for you? Yeah. What, uh, one way, the question was always in my mind and then something else happened. Somebody gave a talk and, uh, at which point I realized that there's no framework even dealing with this. Mm-hmm. So continuing our conversation, you see suicidal state of mind is the most lethal psychiatric condition. No question. More little than schizophrenia, more little than bipolar disorder, more little than borderline personality disorder. And for reasons of shame or whatever reasons, uh, um, in when I started working on this is 2008, uh, there was no medical term for that illness. And it's the most lethal illness in psychiatry. And so uh, when I realized that I stopped doing what I was doing, which was family uh, approach treating bipolar disorder, and uh, methodically started working on describing this mental state uh, uh, that people could recognize, diagnose, treat. Uh, just uh, like any other Just illness. any other state, like just like depression, just like panic attack, uh, without asking somebody to diagnose themselves. Mm-hmm. As you know, you would never ask a psychotic person to diagnose themselves. Yeah. Are uh, you manic right now? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's yet that's what we do and we still do. If someone is suicidal, mm-hmm. as a family member, as a teacher, what do you do? What should you do? Um, well, I think it's important for everyone to know uh the syndrome, the symptoms of that syndrome. Like for instance, uh, most people now, not 30 years ago, but now no symptoms of depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people know symptoms of mania. Uh, Everybody knows uh, symptoms of a choking. Okay. okay? And knows how to save a choking victim, right? It's in every restaurant. Everybody uh, needs to know uh, the suicidal state of mind and what the symptoms are. Okay, so they can uh, 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 they can see and hear when their loved ones talk about it because it's recognizable. And so it's recognizable even if someone doesn't tell you they're suicidal. You would just notice and have a gut feeling. Uh, okay, important question. Notice because people tell you. Okay, and there's a particular fifteen actually criteria. And five of them are the main ones uh, oh, that wanna, you can yeah. recognize. If you could tell me what those are. But there's also gut feeling, which is your emotional reaction to somebody. Uh, and that's a separate issue that we're also working on. And that can tell you. 
Okay. And it's about 50-50. And that's for like clinicians, family mm-hmm. members. Okay. Can you walk me through then what those criteria are to meet this syndrome? Um, there are uh, five criteria. Let me first name them. And then I'll give you, a, then can tell you how to ask about them right away. Is that uh, family members should not uh, take upon themselves to diagnose and, and treat. Mm-hmm. Okay, necessarily. Because it's a, it's a psychiatrist's job. But they could know. They should know what uh, uh, people tell them, okay? Because most of uh, what people say about the uh, state of uh, suicidal crisis syndrome, uh, they say they don't hide it; it just goes unnoticed. So there are five criteria. One is uh, criterion A and four criteria B. So the first criterion, criterion A, in its part, half of the syndrome, is feeling of entrapment or uh, frantic hopelessness. And it's a desire to, almost I would say desperate desire to escape an unbearable life situation when all routes to escape are blocked. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. And people know uh, exactly what that is. The second one is state of uh, uh, emotional discontrol or emotional pain. The third one one is loss of uh, control over your thoughts. The fourth one is insomnia, and the fifth one is uh, withdrawal. So, uh, when uh, if you are a friend, let me I'll talk to you the way a psychiatrist would ask somebody. But now imagine that you listen to somebody's conversation. Just keep looking for those things when you're talking to a friend or you know your mother or your uh, anybody. So the first question is whatever you encounter in life right now, whatever brought you to my office, okay, with this problem, okay, uh, is, are there any solutions to it? Do you see any options? Or do you feel trapped and you feel cornered? And there's no option. So that's the first question. Uh, and um, if you are listening to uh, a friend or loved one, if a person is telling you about a uh, life situation they find themselves in that I just described previously, you know, the the woman who I you know the only woman who cared about me left me, okay. Or, you know, I failed my MCATs. I'm not going to medical school. My parents are going to kill me. I let them down. Uh, there's no way. So that's you can hear people talk about it. Second, the uh, whatever brings you here right now, whatever we're talking about, okay. Do you feel pain? Is it is it painful to you? when we talk about that, do you feel emotional pain? Mm-hmm. Uh, the third question is, and again, people when tell you that, you know, uh, the woman left me, they only had care for me, and, and I can't believe how much it hurts. You don't need to ask. I mean, they tell you themselves. And usually you can hear it. The third question is, um, when you think about this, this problem that we're just talking about, uh, can you control your thoughts? Or you feel your thoughts are controlling you? And when somebody in this state, they know exactly what you're talking about and what you described, a rabbit hole of hopelessness. Okay. And then just like this is, yes. nonstop thoughts. This is a criterion uh, uh, B2. Okay. And a really important one. Uh, and when these thoughts that I described to you come with the feeling of headache or pressure in your head, which could be related to emotional pain, okay, that's even more critical. Okay of losing control over your thoughts. So the third question, uh, uh, the fourth question is, does it happen to you at night, these thoughts? Okay, or can you sleep? And the last question is, have you told anybody about it? So that's really, really important what I described to you. There's five out of 15 criteria, there are others. Like for instance, being uh, hypervigilant, being agitated, uh, not being able to experience any pleasure, having like severe, uh, super severe anxiety with strange sensations in your body, which is very important. But these five that I described to you uh, uh, nail uh, nail most of it. And how common is this in the medical community? Like, I feel like I've gone to therapists my whole life. I've been in the ER I, as someone with borderline, you know, that's one of the criteria for mm. borderline. Um, I don't know if I've ever been asked those specific questions. You haven't. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you haven't because at the moment, 
this diagnosis of suicide crisis syndrome mm -hmm. is not an official diagnosis. Okay. And the so main, that's what you're working on right now. Yeah. And the main, uh, if I would get something uh, for to save humanity out of this interview, uh, uh, that diagnosis that I described to you, that needs to be an official diagnosis in, in, the DSM. in DSM. And it is under consideration. Mm -hmm. We applied uh, the, the second time. It's a, a thousand page long application. Holy moly. And um, it is the only condition to my knowledge uh, in DSM that actually is based on research and not on expert consensus. It's actually based on like a hundred papers that we wrote. And so if you notice some a family member mm -hmm. or loved one who's withdrawing, maybe yeah. they've told you they've brought up, I've been having these thoughts, mm -hmm. I feel hopeless, no one cares about me. And you're saying they need to see some like a, a, mm -hmm. a psychiatrist or a professional. Right. So what is the next step? Do you call 911? Do you? Uh, well, I think uh, you talk, tell a person, if you talk to them, hopefully that's somebody you cared about, and you can level with them and, and say, look, what you're saying is sounds really pretty scary. You need help. Mm -hmm. Like right now, it needs to be needs to be treated i mean it's it's pretty bad so you know let's go see somebody yes because i feel like when people call 911 when someone is in a suicidal mm. state i almost feel in my own experience and friends of mine and people i was in treatment mm. with it makes it worse uh, most of the, the time hospital it, does the hospital and the if a police officer shows up too mm. um and i feel like they have no training in mental health and how to even communicate with someone who's in that state you know, putting them in just a hold. I feel like sometimes it's a band-aid solution of let's just keep them alive well, it treats, physically. It treats the therapist, actually, mostly because the therapist doesn't need to deal with it. Um, see, uh, I don't hospitalize suicidal people. Okay. I really don't. I rarely hospitalize anyone. I mean, really. Um, even with bipolar disorder, it all can be treated as an outpatient if the family is involved. Um, and the highest risk of any, uh, uh, actually, of any uh, time period, the highest risk period for suicide is the first week after hospital discharge. 200-fold for women increased risk and 100-fold for men. And uh, nobody really investigated so far why that's the case. It may be that facing the world after you were in a hospital is hard, or maybe uh, being in a hospital made you worse and you were bad to begin with. So, um, yeah. I um, have never shared this on the podcast, but and I was thinking possibly down the road I would do an episode on it. Um, I had an attempt many, many years ago, and I was at Bellevue Hospital, and my discharge plan was like nothing. Like they just like let you out mm -hmm. as if, nothing happened. It's like, you're in here, your insurance can only pay for a certain amount of days. If you're physically fine enough to leave, then they kick you out. And to me, years later, going to McLean, which was an amazing experience, and I love my team there. Um, I, I constantly revisit that time mm. of how a, a neglected in my care I felt. Right. Well, I, it's terrible. I mean, what you're telling is terrible, but not atypical. Things are changing now uh, because, you know, of the uh, inexorable, uh, relentless uh, uh, rise in suicide since rates since 1999. I also felt a lack of humanity mm -hmm. in my care. Um, not once did anyone ask me, like, how do you feel? Are you okay? Like, there was no human, yeah, human response. It was very, like... I mean, I had all these physical problems that they were mm. trying to fix. Um, and it was kind of like, oh, we just need to get you better and then shoo you out of here for the next patient. Um, and I, I do feel like part of that inspired this work and having these conversations because I felt course. like no one talked to me about it. And even just in my family unit, it was very elephant in the room, hush, hush for years and years and years. Yes. Well, um, one of the approaches... We haven't tested yet, but I'm pretty sure. Um, having worked with bipolar families mm -hmm. and uh, for 20 years now, um, and uh, using the family approach 
to treatment of bipolar disorder for 20 years. And a lot of these people were suicidal when they're uh, depressed. I'm convinced that the best approach to uh, suicide prevention uh, clinically and therapeutically is actually get the family involved. In our family center for bipolar disorder, we don't take individual patients. I mean, people come here, by the way, when they, everything else failed to us, and uh, they come as families, and uh, they sign, sign waiver, uh, a HIPAA waiver, so everybody talks to each other, and uh, we have, you know, have good outcomes. Why do you think that is? What? Well, like, why, when the family is involved, I know you wrote a whole book on this, mm -hmm. um, are the rates of, of um, getting better so much higher? Um, of remission? Of, you're talking about suicide or bipolar? I guess both, just mental health care in general. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, because, uh, I mean... I'm, it's like support? It's not only support. I mean, what I'm saying, uh, it, it's like, to me, it sounds very simple. I mean, how can you, it's on the same level as, how can you um, uh, uh, diagnose suicide? Uh, how can you rely on the person in the worst moment in their life, okay, to tell you accurately what they're going to do. I mean, how absurd is that? Yeah. Right? So the same thing is that how can you uh, treat uh, uh, mental illness and suicidal uh, state outside the family when the family is sometimes is the cause, uh, sometimes is the cure, but always involved? Mm -hmm. One way or another. Mm -hmm. And can also probably give you, yeah, additional perspective. Of course. Makes of course. a lot of sense. Um, you briefly mentioned the rise in suicide mm -hmm. since, what was the year? 1999. 1999. What do you attribute that to? Or what are some of the main factors? There is an association that everybody uh, knows about. Um, but... Um, not sure it's a cause, but certainly an association uh, of um, in the United States. Uh, th this is uh, the you know, appearance of social media, TikTok. I mean, TikTok. Well, it started way, way before TikTok. Um, it's a screen time. It started with a screen time. It started with the cell phones. It started with instant connection. There's one thing that happened, but you know it didn't happen all over the world. It's the United States. Okay. Um, uh, for instance, in um, Britain uh, uh, and Israel, suicide rates are fairly flat, despite that. Uh, in Korea, they increased also. Uh, there's other reasons. For instance, the, you know, uh, the kind of uh, fraying fabric of American society uh, that we're all experiencing right now, which to some extent is uh, um, um, promulgated by social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, social issues, ris disappearance of middle class and uh, income inequality, all of that, um, essentially, I would say, um, the um, fracture of American dream. I think that started happening about that time consciously. I think it all contributes. But screen time uh, and social media and all that is uh, you know, pretty bad. Yeah, when I read that age 10 to 25... 10 seems so young for suicide. Right. And is that a fairly new phenomenon? Yes. Is is that age bracket? Uh, it is not a new phenomenon because, you know, young children were dying by suicide. The rates are very low and they continue to be low, but the increase in the rates is very steep. 2017 uh, of the last 23 years, was the worst year in terms of the suicide increase. In that one year, uh, children's suicide went up by 50%. Do you think that has to do with bullying or social media? Social media, uh, 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 probably probably both. What is known, okay, and uh, this is particularly about girls, actually, um, is that uh, if you take four steps, uh, one is screen time of any sort. Okay, including computers, then uh, cell phone screen time, social media, and cyberbullying. Okay, four steps, one to another, increasing stress. 
So each of these steps is associated with worse suicide risk. And each of these steps, uh, suicide risk increases faster for girls than for boys. I guess I wanted to go into kind of prevention. Sure. And why is a suicide-specific diagnosis necessary? Um, because um, our research shows, and remarkably so, I mean, I've done research in about six or seven different fields, but it's the only time that I see that. What our research shows is that the syndrome that I described to you, mm-hmm. the mental state, is the same everywhere, uh, regardless of culture, regardless of age, uh, regardless of uh, diagnosis, with the exception of somebody being acutely psychotic. Exactly the same. Uh, we did a study in 15 countries on four continents, and it is the same in Korea, in Taiwan, in Hungary, in Italy, in the United States, exactly the same thing. Suicidal ideation, but it is not. Okay. But the syndrome is the same. Okay, so the actual syndrome of like that, the the moment that something pushes you over the edge. Yes, that mental state, that's the illness. Yes. You see, uh, su- suicide, uh, suicidal mental state is an illness. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that illness is the same regardless of where you are and what gets you to that point. Do you and your team treat it like a physical illness? Like, do you think of these different mental illnesses, this state, Mm -hmm. as similarly to how you should treat someone with diabetes or with cancer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, And um, see, uh, I said that, I mentioned that our submission to uh, uh, the, The the DSM committee uh, is is uh, actually long. We describe the state. Mm-hmm. We know what it is. We know how it behaves. We know it's the same everywhere. So the last step, and we had clinical trials to test all this, the last step that we need to do uh, is two things, actually, two steps. One is that we need to implement it everywhere, mm-hmm. and I'm working on it internationally uh, uh, in several countries. And the other one, we need to treat it and make sure that it works, that suicide rates goes down both by diagnosing it and, uh, you know, addressing it psychotherapeutically because people are not alone, but primarily by treating it medically. There are certain biological uh, uh, underpinnings of the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are certain neurotransmitters that underlie it. This is a hypothesis. Uh, uh, We haven't tested it yet, although we wrote the paper. And if you give people certain medications for a short period of time, we believe, uh, that wave that drives people over the edge Passes. subsides. It's like it's like giving people Tylenol when they have severe headache. People in that state, they can't talk, they can't comprehend. You cannot do psychotherapy when people are like that. So the psychotherapeutic approach to people in acute suicidal state is not gonna work. And so what are some of those medications or those inter- those interceptions? Again, I think, uh, I, think I did it uh, uh, as a doctor yeah. and other people did as doctors. I don't have a clinical trial to tell you. Uh, because that's what needs to be conducted and we need money to do that. Um, But the uh, most important, uh, uh, so when somebody is in acute, let me see, when somebody cannot sleep, okay, and has severe anxiety with somatic symptoms, okay, the medication that will help you would be a benzodiazepine of the current medications and sedating uh, antipsychotic. There are actually three medications, not one. Benzo is just one of them. Yeah. Um, the second medication is a sedating antipsychotic, uh, some, because that treats uh, loss of cognitive control when your thinking is out of control. So it kind of just like puts you to sleep? <laughs> no, calms down your thinking. Okay. Specifically, these medications uh, target your unwanted thoughts. Yes, yeah. So that combination. And the third one, uh, that actually works, and it sounds like it's the most dangerous one, Mm-hmm. But I actually think uh, uh, that that's also very important. And uh, it's when you're in pain, uh, it's opioidergic system. Okay, it is your opiate receptors are out of control. So um, uh, something like buprenorphine would work. And again, what we're talking about, the state is hours long. Yeah, and no one-time thing. Right, it's a one-time thing. Uh, and this is what ketamine does. Yeah. Uh, except, uh, you know, I'm not a ketamine, ketamine proponent. Specialist, yeah, okay. Because it's an opiate. It makes people euphoric. Do you fear 
that someone could get addicted? In 48 hours, no. No, but I'm saying, what if someone ha goes through the suicidal thing multiple times? and um, Or is that just like a risk that you guys have to consider? If somebody, uh, if somebody is sick enough in that state mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, they can kill themselves, I think you need to take the you, risk. You, of course, you weigh yeah. the risk of keeping someone alive. Right. Um, what are things clinicians from your mm -hmm. research need to watch out for? Um, like, do you, do you recommend crisis plans? Um, we recommend, um, a systematic approach. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost easier to explain when you look at the model. Um, so let me repeat the model and then I'll with the systematic approaches. So there's long-term risk factors. Mm -hmm. There are no immediate risk, but they increase your risk lifetime. There's stressful life events that you need to manage. There is suicidal narrative, uh, which is perceived state of no future that you need to restructure. And then there's suicide crisis syndrome that you need to treat medically. And then somebody may be on the ledge. Okay. So, and um, so you, in this system that I described to you, five-step system, you go backwards. So the first thing you do when somebody is suicidal, you take the gun out of their hand. You take the pills away. Okay, it's obvious, but it's not done. Mm -hmm. uh, you take them off the ledge. The second thing, you treat the, the syndrome. You don't start psychotherapy before you treat the syndrome because people cannot process it. When somebody in the state, it's like a broken arm. You don't do psychotherapy when somebody is in acute pain with a broken arm. Or it's like exactly what you're saying. It's like someone who's in a psychotic state yeah. who's yeah. or who's hallucinating, yeah. seeing things. Yes. So you need to treat that. After you treat that and the syndrome is gone or subsided, then you can start working uh, with therapy on restructuring, you know, your perception of life, your life narrative. But not before. Mm -hmm. Once you're able to do that and work with that, you work with, uh, you know, uh, management of stressful life events and long-term therapy, uh, maybe to reduce perfectionism or uh, things like that. I have faced stigma in my own life. I've met many people who have faced a lot of stigma mm -hmm. around suic suicidality, around suicide right. specifically, that it's attention-seeking, that it's selfish. Um, you've worked with suicidal patients for a long mm -hmm. time in your career, what do you say to someone who, who believes that has that narrative? Um, suicide is not attention seeking. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the end of life. Okay. Suicidal crisis is not syndrome is not attention seeking seeking. And it's a, a very painful, unbearable mental state. Suicidal ideation on the other hand, quote unquote, uh, what we call suicide radiation can be attention seeking and can be dramatic. They're that very, very different things. Okay. What can someone who, who doesn't have insurance or like the financial resources to mm -hmm. get help? Is there any advice you have for them? Meaning, what if somebody feels like this mm -hmm. and they have no insurance? Yeah, they have no insurance or, yeah, they don't know where to seek help financially. Like going to the hospital or seeing a doctor doesn't seem like an option. Um, well, there is uh, obviously suicide prevention hotline. Do you recommend the hotlines? Um, I would recommend the hotlines. Okay. Okay, I actually would recommend the hotline. Uh, there are uh, people uh, on the, always on the end of, uh, at the end of the phone, uh, of, of the phone line. They pick up the phone, they talk to you. I mean, they're not doctors, uh, but you, they can connect you. They can hold you on because the syndrome is short-lived. Our approach is, uh, is the, the syndrome should be in DSM. That's number one state. Okay, state. number one. The first step. Yep. Okay, once it's in DSM, three things are going to happen. One is it, is it will be taught in all medical schools, in all nursing schools, and not in, in all uh, kind of uh, anything related to healthcare. It's everybody's going to know about it. Two. Insurance. Then uh, you can bill for they'll, it. They'll bill for it, which at the moment you can't. Okay. And three, it will stimulate research 
because there is a code and there is a diagnosis. And, and pharma is going to pay for it because funding. they'll... Yeah. It's going to change everything. Yeah, what kind of research are, is you, and, are you, you and your team doing at Mount Sinai? At the moment? Yes. Uh, we're doing um, actually several things. Uh, one is uh, we're um, submitted a protocol for treatment with the stream medication that I described okay. to you. A randomized trial to see which one works the best. Just as you say, maybe benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine plus antipsychotic, benzodiazepine plus antipsychotic plus uh, uh, mu opiate agonist, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, see which one works the best. And our you know, uh, hypothesis that we need you need all three. So that's one study. The other study is um, uh, we want we're implementing. Uh, the suicide crisis syndrome assessment uh, all over Mount Sinai health system. And uh, we'll see how that will change uh, and prevent suicide. That alone, just the fact that everybody assesses it, they said nobody knows about it. So everybody in Mount Sinai will know about it. Mm -hmm. And it's the largest health system in, in, uh, in New York. So uh, let's see what it does to prevent suicide. What are the ethics and legal issues when it comes to human subjects in these trials? Um, meaning in suicide-related, uh, suicide prevention trials? Yeah. Uh, very serious. Uh, for instance, uh, you cannot, uh, at the moment, you cannot do a clinical trial without treatment. Like uh, in, our, in our study, international study that I described to you that showed that suicide crisis syndrome is the same everywhere, uh, it, it's, internet, it's an internet-based study. It must have been treatment. They wouldn't approve it otherwise. So at several steps during the questionnaire, uh, several, uh, uh, there would be, a, uh, if somebody triggers something, there would be a referral Okay. Okay. to a local doctor, uh, to a local therapist, to... Um, uh, or to uh, what hotline. There's many, many protections, mm. okay, because uh, although generally speaking, uh, uh, talking about suicide does not increase risk uh, of suicide, we really don't know 100% and want to make sure that all the safeguards are there. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through your 2005 findings between pharmaceutical trials in scientific journals and, big, and pharma? I was, I was interested. I read this when I was yeah. looking you up and... Well, uh, yes, of course. Conflict of interest. Um, well, we don't think about it. And I don't know, maybe we didn't think about it. Now we think of after the opiate crisis, we think about it much more. But at that time, it was actually before the opiate crisis became uh, uh, obvious. Uh, uh, the idea that uh, pharmaceutical companies could bias trials mm -hmm. Uh, was you know uh, relatively unknown and uh, novel. So, and we decided to test that. And so, what we did, we chose three very prestigious journals, and it was very simple. We uh, uh, coded the studies whether it was favorable to the test drug or unfavor unfavorable, and uh, then we looked at who paid for the study. Mm -hmm. And it was like a clock. If the company paid for the study, then the outcome was 75% favorable to the drug that they paid for. If the opponent pay, paid for the study, it was 25%. And nobody paid for the study or NIMH, it was 50%. Mm -hmm. So it was the only variable really that worked who funded the study. And then what about what gets, I would, I would think that there would be a connection of what gets implemented into medical school then. I'm sure there. You know, are. and what's taught? Uh, well, it's a it's a long uh, discussion. Let me mention just one thing to you, uh, and you make your own conclusions. Uh, when we switch, when we moved from DSM four to DSM five, the uh, ADHD onset age was raised from seven to thirteen. Okay, so on DSM four, uh, the ADHD onset. Uh, should be in a diagnosis before age 7. Now it's before age 13, which means that uh, the number of people who have ADHD okay, probably went up fivefold. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens to the drug sales, to Adderall sales? Exponentially. 
Yeah. So what are your views on the increase? I mean, right now we're having a shortage of Adderall right. in the United States. That's wild to think yes. about. You know, what are your views on the increasingly wide use of not only Adderall, mm -hmm. Xanax, SSRIs, and just medication? Uh, generally for people, mm -hmm. psychotropic medications. Uh, Is it just that more and more people need it, more and more people are sick, more and more, you know, it's more openly discussed now, so people aren't shamed, so they get the treatment, or is it over-prescribed? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. Uh, I think uh, uh, more people uh, can identify the need for it, but it's clearly over-prescribed and in ways that uh, you may not find uh, particularly uh, like useful uh, or, or ethical. Do you implement any holistic, like, do you guys talk about any holistic treatment for, for suicide or just psychiatric care in general? Like, what is the, in your career, mm -hmm. the connection? Like, have you, yeah, is that ever implemented in the hospital or when you even were in medical school? Do they talk about diet? Do they talk about stress um, and these things? Well, stress management is 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 really important, and mm -hmm. we talked about it in the model. Uh, I don't know uh, about diet, uh, but uh, I think dietitian is important because psychotropic drugs uh, uh, cause uh, appetite and weight changes. Totally, but and also depre like if I'm eating McDonald's every single day and drinking a mm -hmm. liter of Coca Cola, that can't be good for my my body or my brain health. You'll gain 30 pounds. But also just don't you think like the high of sugar and the come down of sugar and affecting your mood? And I feel yes. like these are things that aren't really discussed or studied as much. Look, look, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important. I mean, look, eating disorders are uh, everywhere also, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we've been talking about having a dietitian uh, and uh, in uh, the family center because a lot of people on medications, we don't have one. Um, but uh, yes, absolutely. Just so I asked people to write in some additional mm. questions, because obviously I prepare kind of some of the things I want to talk about. Um, and someone wrote to me today saying that their brother committed suicide last year, and they are struggling with immense guilt. Um, do you have any advice, advice or thoughts on this? And do you see this even in your own patients' families? Yes. Uh, and I treat uh, people uh, people like that. I cannot give a generic advice. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing uh, that I want to repeat, um, and the only thing actually I can say a couple of things. One is, repeat what I just said, is that people when die by suicide, they're an immense uh, pain, typically, and an immense unbearable pain, sometimes chronic pain. And the people who feel the guiltiest are usually the one the ones that were the closest, and um, actually, instead of not doing something as they think, they actually kept that person alive for the last year or months because they did everything possible. Otherwise, somebody would have uh, killed themselves even sooner. If you're not comfortable talking about this, we don't have to, but you, you shared with me the first patient mm -hmm. who committed suicide. And you said that you had two other patients out of 30,000. Um, did each one affect you kind of in a different way? Of course. Yeah? And I remember every one of them, like, vividly. You can't, you can't forget that. I can tell you uh, what our last conversation was. I can tell you what their story is. I can tell you absolutely everything, how I reacted, how I talked to their families. You don't forget these things. And in terms of someone who has committed suicide that you worked with, how do you personally deal with that? Painful. Yeah. It's a loss. I know. Do you feel like grief? Of course. And you have to go through it? Yeah. Of course. Of course do. do you talk to other colleagues who work in the space and have dealt with similar things? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, Particularly, and uh, um, actually more so in the course of our research, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, there's a, my long-term colleague, 
uh, and uh, research and clinic with Lisa Coyne. I've been working with her for 26 years. And um, she actually uh, talked about people. Uh, she lost two people. And uh, now uh, she can recognize the syndrome in the same way. And she says, you know, this woman attempted suicide. She survived. And she denied it. She said uh, she had a thought, a conscious thought of uh, actually uh, killing herself five seconds before she attempted. But she had the syndrome for a week. So it just, you know, we, talk, need, we need to be able to talk about this. Mm-hmm. But it's hard. It's, it's not. It's not normal work. It's not. Uh, it's. A, I mean, it's. 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 Um. There's an element of intimacy, and depth, and like you're saying, you're interested in the human mind, and that it's a puzzle. Um, that's how it started. But it's it's more emotionally taxing than than a, many other job career choices. Of course. Career paths. That's what so I said. I, the in, initial uh, drive was intellectual. Uh, but uh, not not right now. Not right now. I don't work with uh, uh, usually with easy patients. Yeah. Okay. I have colleagues who look at me and say, "Why are you doing this?" I mean, uh, just run an Adderall clinic. They come, they go. You prescribe Adderall, and then uh, they pay. I mean, why are you doing this? But that's what I mean. It's it's not you're in it for a, a deeper. No, I'm not in it for the money. No, no, of course not. Or for I'm, anything. No, no, no. I'm saying you're in it to make a change. Yes. And and for a deeper, like, emotional reason of uh, a drive in your life. Yes. Uh, uh, well, Maybe for meaning. For meaning. Yeah. Absolutely. I would imagine what you're doing is also for meaning. Definitely. <laughs> well, it was so lovely to meet you. Do you feel like we covered everything? Is there anything else you would like to tell my listeners? Hope is... There, I mean, it's treatable. Okay, it's absolutely treatable uh, and preventable, uh, and uh, uh, you know, support our cause. Let's get it into DSM. If you or your loved one needs help right now, you know where to find me, uh, and uh, you know, we'll find a way to help. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.